Shout outs this week to some of our PR industry friends, Mary from Seattle, Anna from Pittsburgh, and Pete from Detroit. Today's episode is must listening for anyone in the PR field. We talk about a terrible tragedy that led to the emergence of the PR profession as a critical component of doing business. In the process, we learn about one of the founders of the PR profession, Ivy Lee, and how a crisis created a need that only good PR advice could fill. The topic for today's episode is one that a few listeners suggested we cover. If you have a suggestion, a question, or a comment, send it to me through email at tim at shapingopinion.com. If you want, we can give you a shout out. And as always, thank you for being a listener to the Shaping Opinion podcast. You're the reason we do this. This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. Can you describe a time when you were able to convince a client or an organization to do the right thing when their initial leaning was against it? Well, my entire uh, career, such as it is, I've been faced with uh, challenges like that. And the most current one that is etched in my mind is a time where I suggested to the client that they do the right thing, but they didn't. And to make a long story short, it was a hospital. And this happened about three months ago. And I'd worked for the hospital for a long time. And then I stopped working for them. And they called me back in and they said, we've got a problem in that we've got a uh, trial program that admits people into the hospital and we send them to specific floors, and they can't use their own primary doctor. They've got to use a doctor who's on the floor, paid by the hospital, and it's much better for them because it's a 24-7 service as opposed to calling your own doctor uh, who may or may not be around. And the community rebelled against this program. They hated it. They wanted, they said, you're taking away our doctor. And I pleaded with the client to compromise to say, look, we're just going to try this. If you still want your doctor, you can go to a floor on which your doctor is uh, admitting and uh, and we'll compromise with them. And they said, no, we we know this is right. We uh, disagree with your advice. And so finally, and I've worked as a set for this company, for for this hospital for close to a decade and a half, I said, look, if you're not going to follow my advice, uh, that's it. I'm no good to you and I'm not worth the money you're paying me. I left, and a month later, uh, my good friend who had been my employer for uh, 15 years, the CEO of the hospital, was uh, forced to step down because the policy was just wrong. And that's an example of uh, if the client had done the right thing, everybody still would be in business. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion Podcast, we're joined by Fraser Seitel. He's a public relations veteran, a professor, and an author. The reason we're talking to him today is about a tragic point in U.S. history that led to the creation of the modern PR profession. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we'll talk with Fraser about the Ludlow Massacre, which happened in a small Colorado mining town in 1914. We'll talk about the role that billionaire John D. Rockefeller played, and we'll talk about Ivy Lee and how he earned a place in history as one of the fathers of the PR profession, effectively putting the PR profession on the map. During the summer of 1913, the United Mine Workers Labor Union started to try to organize the 11,000 coal miners at John D. Rockefeller's Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. Most of these workers were immigrants from Italy, Greece, and Serbia. They had been brought in to replace other workers who had gone on strike 10 years earlier. Their grievances centered on low pay, long hours, and allegations of corruption. In short order, these 8,000 employees went on strike. They wanted a 10% pay raise, an eight-hour workday, and the right to live and trade outside of the company-owned town. Everything they wanted was already required by Colorado law, 
but enforcement of the law was another issue. Not long after they went on strike, the workers were evicted from their company-owned homes. That's when they decided to set up makeshift tent cities surrounding the mines in which they had worked. The largest of the tent cities was known as the Ludlow Camp. John D. Rockefeller decided to hire a detective agency that was staffed by a group of roughnecks out of Texas. The detectives would periodically raid striking workers' camps. Sometimes they'd fire off their weapons, rifles, and shotguns to intimidate the striking workers and their families. By November, the Colorado governor called in the Colorado National Guard at the request of the company. The Guard formed militias, and their members carried out more raids and more shootings in the tent cities. The strike went on through the winter, and in the spring, Rockefeller appeared before Congress. He described the standoff as, quote, a national issue whether workers shall be allowed to work under such conditions as they may choose. He said the workers were satisfied with their labor conditions. On April 20, 1914, Four militiamen brandished a machine gun at some of the striking workers. At some point, someone fired the first shot. It's not known who. But the one thing everyone agreed on is that a full day of gunfighting followed. That night, the National Guard set fire to the Ludlow camp. Thirteen residents who tried to run away were shot and killed as the camp burned, where many others burned to death. In the Ludlow camp, there was a hospital tent called the Women's Infirmary for sick women and their children. The day after the Ludlow raid, four women and 11 children were found. All of the children and two of the women were dead. Mary Petrucci was one of the survivors. She lost three of her children in that fire. Fire wasn't the only weapon of choice. The National Guard had sprayed the Ludlow camp with machine gun fire. At least 66 were killed, including those women and children. News of the Ludlow massacre, as it would be known, spread. It filled newspapers across the country and brought government and public pressure down on John D. Rockefeller in ways he never anticipated. Fraser Seitel is one of the senior statesmen in the PR field today, and over the years he himself has served as spokesperson for the Rockefeller family. By the time he took his role, both the PR profession and the Rockefeller family had evolved. Well, I went to work for the Chase Bank in... uh the 1970s, if you can imagine anyone being alive then. And the CEO of the Chase Bank at the time, this is the predecessor of J.P. Morgan Chase today, was David Rockefeller, who was the son of John D. Rockefeller Jr., who was the uh, owner of the famous Ludlow, Colorado Iron and Fuel Company in Ludlow, Colorado, where this Ludlow massacre took place. And as a result of that massacre and its effect on the Rockefeller family, as Mr. Rockefeller later told me when uh, we were uh, helping him with his memoirs, the Ludlow massacre, which really, to my mind, began the modern practice of public relations, uh, according to David Rockefeller, was the, was, was the critical moment in the Rockefeller family's history that convinced them that philanthropy and openness and uh, helping society was the thing to do. So that that massacre really introduced to that family the importance of ethics and uh, eleemosynary uh, giving and uh, contributing to society more than any single incident, according to the person involved's son, David Rockefeller. Well, let's talk about the players now. I in my intro today, I gave an overview of what actually happened. But let's talk about some of the players now in this story. And the first one that you mentioned was John D. Rockefeller Jr. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was the son of John D. Rockefeller, the creator of Standard Oil. And John D. Rockefeller himself uh, was a uh, a much, uh, was a controversial figure of the day. Uh, There were reports that he had threatened other oil companies to allow him to build his colossus of an oil company and really introduced oil and uh, for running steam engines and cars and so on to society. And that was, uh, that was the basis on which the Rockefeller family became the wealthiest family in the world. Uh, of their time, they, uh, they were the, the Bill Gates and Warren Buffetts of their time. And John D. Rockefeller himself, therefore, uh, who was a tough, tough businessman, 
uh, became the wealthiest man in the world. His son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., was much different. He didn't like business. He was much uh, more comfortable in uh, uh, nonprofit organizations and in, in uh, building things that, uh, that were more society-oriented than his father. He didn't like the rough and tumble of business, but his father nonetheless wanted him to go into to, to, to succeed him at Standard Oil and the many interests that the family had so that John D. Jr. was put in charge of a number of Rockefeller enterprises, including, most specifically for our purposes, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, in Ludlow, Colorado. How would you describe his management style? John D. Jr., as I said, was uh, much more uh, timid, I guess, is, is a word that he probably wouldn't approve of, but I think it explains it much more so than his father, who was a dynamic and tough businessman. John D. Jr. was, was more of a hands-off manager, and as a consequence of that, many of his enterprises, including the one in Ludlow, he allowed two subordinates to run who gave him reports and told him how, he, how they were doing uh, monthly or quarterly or whatever, but he left them alone. He was an absentee landlord, if you will. These aren't individuals, but these are players in this situation, and that is the United Mine Workers as a union, and then there were the striking workers who lived in the Ludlow camp and some of these other tent cities. Well, in Ludlow, the Colorado Fuel and Iron uh, Company was not unionized, and the workers themselves who lived in camps uh, with uh, generally uh, mostly all men, lived in camps with their wives and their children, complained about their working conditions. The mines were grimy and their working, uh, uh, their, their living conditions were substandard, and they didn't have a union to represent them. So the United Mine Workers were very much interested in doing that. And so the uh, workers at the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company wanted to join the union. The management of the company, as I said, on scene in Colorado, Mr. Rockefeller was back in New York at his headquarters, objected to this. And so there was this friction between the miners and the management. There's one other player that's really big in this story, and his name is Ivy Lee. And I know a little bit of background on him. He's considered one of the fathers of public relations, the field that we're in. And he was a Princeton graduate. He was a Harvard Law School dropout. He had to drop out of law school for, for financial reasons. And he then became a reporter for the New York Journal and the New York Times and the New York World. I don't know if he was employed by all of those papers. Uh, there were reports that he was a freelancer or a stringer for one or two of those. But he became a newspaper reporter, and not long after that, he, he felt that he wasn't making enough money, and he decided to get into work running election campaigns. Can you describe Ivy Lee, his early career in the field of public relations? Yes, well, as you said, he was a newspaper man, and he was a Southerner, and he was a very aristocratic and proper uh, newsman, but he saw along the line that that uh, writing the news uh, was was fine, but there was another element of reporting that no one had uh, moved into, and that was explaining from the standpoint of organizations what it was they were doing and why they were doing it. And so Ivy Lee began in 1906 or so to represent railroads, to try to explain uh, what the railroads are doing to the public. And in those days, of course, nobody trusted business. You had businessmen like John D. Rockefeller and uh, Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick and J.P. Morgan. And these, these people were so phenomenally wealthy, much wealthier than the workers, not unlike today, of course, much wealthier than the workers. And they were distrusted and they were despised and they were vilified by journalists of the day, people like uh, Ida Tarbell and Sin uh, Upton Sinclair. These were people they called the muckrakers because they raked up the muck about these, these fat cat businessmen. Well, Ivy Lee said, boy, there's nobody defending these businessmen, so I'm going to go to work, if they'll have me, for these companies. And he went to work in 1906 to help the railroads, and specifically, in a very famous event, 
a railroad that he represented crashed in Pennsylvania. And for the first time ever, rather than trying to keep reporters out, Ivy Lee, working for the railroad, invited reporters in to see the crash, to see what happened, to hear from the railroad uh, uh, explaining how this happened and the steps they were taking to make sure that something like this never happened again. And in that manner, in that representing these vilified corporations, Ivy Lee kind of stumbled into creating, you could argue, the modern-day practice of public relations. Not only was it public relations, it was that whole part of public relations we call crisis communications. And he did it. He did it instinctively, it seems, but he did it well because, as you said, he let the media in instead of creating this us-versus-them atmosphere. There was kind of a root to that. Uh, when he started his firm that you mentioned in 1906, he decided to take a different approach. At that time, public relations firms, the few that there were, were pretty much mouthpieces for the organizations that they worked for. And whatever the organization or the company said to them, they took that and ran with it as gospel. Well, what he decided to do, because he had this journalistic background, is he said, no, we're going to communicate to the journalist on the journalist terms. What that means is our information has to be accurate, it has to be authentic, and it has to be in the public interest. Just like the journalists have to write for the public interest. Now, we know there were so many newspapers of that day, and the sensationalism of today could be matched step for step by the media of those days just as well. He created a Declaration of Principles, and this was his basically statement to say, we're different than other PR firms. We care about integrity, and our integrity will give you credibility, our clients. We, it will give you credibility with the media. He sought legitimacy for the PR field. There were a few things that he said there. One of them he said, this is not a press bureau. All of our work is done in the open. We aim to supply actual news. This is not an advertising agency. If you think any of our matter ought to properly go out to your business office, do not use it. In other words, These aren't just words that are paid to be crafted. These are real words. This is real information. It's real truth. Then another thing he said was that our matter, meaning our subject matter, is accurate. Further details on any subject treated will be supplied promptly, and any editor will be assisted most carefully in verifying directly any statement of fact. What he meant there was, we're going to help you get the information you need on deadline, and we're going to help you vet that information to make sure it's true. And then his final declaration of principles principle, he says, in brief, our plan is frankly and openly on behalf of our business concerns and public institutions to supply the press and the public prompt and accurate information concerning a subject which is of value and interest to the public to know about. And that was his way of basically saying, we're going to be transparent, honest, and accurate. What do you think about those Declaration of Principles? Were they used as a marketing tool for him, or did they really have weight with the media and with the public? I think both, really. And and the way that I, uh, I break down those principles that you cited, And the reason that it seems to me there have been a lot of people who claim to be fathers of public relations, but why I I believe that that Ivy Lee really was the father of public relations. You know, there have been others mentioned, Edward Bernays, Tim O'Brien, others. Right. Ivy Lee, it seemed to me, stood for two things. Number one was that he said, if your policies are wrong, Mr. Rockefeller, change the policies. In other words, if your workers really do have a case that their living conditions are horrendous and their working conditions are awful, change them. Don't just speak, change them. In other words, action must come, performance must come before publicity. And that's a principle, number one, that I think has to hold true today in public relations. And then the second principle that that, that you cited, it seems to me, is that after you've fixed the action, but only after you've fixed it, communicate it. Don't hide your light under a bushel. And it seems to me that the public relations practitioners of today, at least as far as I'm concerned, 
that's what you that's the counsel that you have to proffer. You have to say, look, let's look at what you're doing. And if what you are doing is wrong, let's fix that first and then communicate it. In other words, let's fix the performance and then get the publicity. In other, other words, you can't pour perfume on a skunk. And that, to me, is why Ivy Lee was the creator of this strange uh, little field today that we call public relations. Now, that brings me to the whole standoff and the raid of the, the Ludlow massacre. I, as I mentioned, I talked about it in my intro. I detailed the facts around the raid. Sixty-six people were killed. Eleven children and women were among the dead. Rockefeller knew what was going on, but he denied having anything to do with the ma- massacre. So can you describe what the scene was after the massacre, the next day, the fallout from the massacre? Oh, it was awful. It, it was, uh, it was uh, worse than anything you could imagine. As you said, there were newspapers all over the country, and this was public situation number one. And John D. Rockefeller Jr., who, as I said, was more of a shy and introverted individual, became public enemy number one all over the country. Yeah, but there was no television, and there was no Twitter, and that was good for John D. Rockefeller Jr., but he was uh, ostracized. He was, he was uh, condemned in the most severe language by everyone because what had happened at that, mass- at that Ludlow site was pure and simple a carnage, a massacre of uh, women, men, and children, and it was inexcusable. Here's how the New York Times described it. On April 21st, the New York Times described it as, The Ludlow camp is a mass of charred debris, and buried beneath it is a story of horror, and paralleled in the history of industrial warfare. In the holes, which had been dug for their protection against the rifle's fire, the women and children died like trapped rats when the flames were swept over them. One pit, uncovered the day after the massacre, disclosed the bodies of ten, Actually, it was 11, but the New York Times said 10 children and two women. That painted a picture. As you said, there was no television. This was the day that the the only real news communication was from a newspaper. How powerful was the news coverage in a case like that? Oh, it was eminently powerful. And and, uh, what made it even worse, of course, was the Rockefeller family, J.D. Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his father were not particularly public individuals, just like the other so-called robber barons of the day. They kept to themselves. They didn't want to entertain conversation with anybody else. Uh, Andrew Carnegie's famous epithet, the public be damned, really spoke for the sense of uh, being of these uh, incredibly wealthy people. So not only was the publicity awful and uh, pervasive, but the Rockefellers had no idea whatsoever how to respond to these charges. They weren't used to it, were they? Not at all. And and uh, their instinct was to uh, stay in their offices in New York City and not come out. Well, a few months later, it was June 10th that Rockefeller made a statement, and he actually said this. He said there was no Ludlow massacre. The engagement started as a desperate fight for life by two small squads of militia against an entire tent colony. So he tried to paint those militia as the underdog. And then he said there were no women or children shot by authorities of the state or representatives of the operators. While this loss of life is profoundly to be regretted, it is unjust in the extreme to lay it at the door of the defenders of law and property who were in no slightest way responsible for it. That is complete denial. Well, all of the denials in the face of this uh, great criticism didn't wash, of course. And this this was a painful thing for anybody to acknowledge. And what turned the tide, what moved the situation forward, was the decision that John D. Rockefeller Jr. made to bring in uh, really two people. One was a guy named William Mackenzie King, who was a friend of the family and a Canadian and later became Prime Minister of Canada, but he was a very respected and thoughtful person. And the other decision was to bring in this Southern 
ex-newspaper man who had represented the railroad industry, Ivy Lee, to try to explain to the public uh, that Mr. Rockefeller and, uh, by extension, his father and his family weren't the evil devils that, uh, uh, that they were being portrayed to be. So Ivy Lee enters the situation like a lot of us do in crisis situations after the real damage has been done. He comes into this, well, he was actually already working for Rockefeller, but his, his impact on this situation only was after the situation occurred and Rockefeller couldn't get himself out of it. What did Ivy Lee do first? Well, what he did was he uh, uh, advanced these principles that you articulated to Mr. Rockefeller and said, look, uh, you're, you're not going to be able to dig yourself out of this hole until you not only change your policies, but you also go out to Colorado and be seen as being interested in trying to solve this awful situation. Meeting with the miners, meeting with their families, going out and seeing the conditions, sampling them, experiencing them, and uh, in other words, be visible. And in that way, Ivy Lee said, I will try to humanize you and your family. And that's what he suggested to John D. Rockefeller Jr. And that's ultimately what John D. Rockefeller Jr. decided to follow. Did Rockefeller see the value then of humility? Because, and did he realize that his lack of humility was the thing that was hurting him the most? I, of course, now, uh, Tim, I'm old, but I'm not quite uh, that old to be around in 1914. <laughs> but, you know, I can tell you what his son said. His son said that the Ludlow massacre changed his father dramatically, and it changed the family's dynamic significantly. And from everything that I've been able to listen to, uh, uh, you know, my friend and colleague and, and, and superior officer David Rockefeller for 50 wonderful years, his father was, was a humble man to begin with, and a man who just didn't understand or know what to do in a situation like that. He needed guidance. Fundamentally, he was a good man, and he needed guidance from somebody like Ivy Lee and this uh, William Mackenzie King to see the light. And so his father, uh, uh, J John D. Rockefeller Jr., followed this advice and instinctively believed in it and saw his way to change his image thanks to the counsel that he was getting from Ivy Lee. Based on what you're saying, something tells me that Ivy Lee saw something in that situation. A lot of times we look across the table and we see our client and we know what their strengths and their weaknesses are from our perspectives, what we can do and what we can't do with them. And it would seem to me, based on what you're saying, Ivy Lee must have seen some of that himself in John D. Rockefeller, and he thought... Maybe if they could just meet him and see that he's not the bad guy they think he is. I think I think you're I think you're totally you're you're right on point. I think that that's exactly so. Cool. And I think it's 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 similar as you say. Every time you sit down with a c client who's got a significant problem like this, and you begin by saying, "What happened? What happened here?" And if what happened is not is not coordinated with what we've been saying. And we've got to stop saying what we're saying and get out and learn the facts and be seen as being sincerely interested in solving the situation. And Ivy Lee did see that in John D. Jr. So John D. Jr. went out to Ludlow. And for a time, he lived in Ludlow with the families there. And he put on a miner's uh, cap. And there are very famous pictures of him going around with the miners. And over time, he showed these people that he wasn't the devil that the press had presented him to be, but rather he was a man who was concerned, who had subordinated the responsibility for the mine to uh, this militia and this management that committed these horrible actions, and he was a man willing to change and help the workers, and ultimately the workers formed a union, improved the conditions, 
And as I say, in terms of the Rockefeller family, based on what happened there in 1914 for the next century and plus, as we go on here, the Rockefellers are uh, without question in my mind, the most philanthropic, generous family in the world, thanks to this awful situation at Ludlow. There was an evolution and a timetable that where we could see this happen publicly. In January of 1915, that's when we started to see a softer, gentler Rockefeller. And this is when he testifies before the U.S. Commission on Industrial Relations. He said, I should hope that I could never reach a point where I would not be constantly progressing to something higher, better, both with reference to my own acts and to the general situation in the company. My hope is that I'm progressing and it is my desire to. And then one of the people on the commission said to him, you were like the church says, growing in grace? And then he says, I hope so. I hope that the growth is in that direction. So he didn't overstate it. Then in September of 1915, and you had mentioned that Rockefeller lived with the miners, he met with the miners. By September of 2015, he gives a speech to the miners that culminates some of this activity. He had already met the miners. He had danced with their wives. He had, he had gotten to know them on a personal level. So he says this, We are all partners in a way. Capital can't get along without you men. And you men can't get along without capital. When anybody comes along and tells you that capital and labor can't get along together, that man is your worst enemy. We are getting along friendly enough here in this mine right now. There is no reason why you men can't get along with the managers of my company when I am back in New York. So now he is sort of giving a speech after getting to know the miners, hoping that they have started a new chapter. How did the United Mine Workers react to that? Well, the the United Mine Workers, as far as I can recollect, may not have been convinced because, as I said, they formed at Ludlow their own union, and it was not an affiliated union, as I understand, with the mine workers. So there was still friction. And others who have written about this, including, uh, by the way, George McGovern, the former, uh, the late candidate, Democrat candidate for president, George McGovern wrote his doctoral thesis on the Ludlow massacre, and he was very critical of uh, John D. Rockefeller, critical of Ivy Lee, said the whole thing was a snow job to convince the miners not to join in with the, uh, uh, the mine workers of America and, and pull the wool over the miners' eyes. So even then there was controversy about public relations and the role that Ivy Lee played. But, you know, you mentioned one thing in his testimony with Congress. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was a very religious man. At base, his religion made the strongest impression on D, John D. Rockefeller Jr. He went to church uh, every Sunday. He tithed. He brought his, his children up by donating to the church and going to church and uh, saying their prayers and so on. So he's a very religious man. So uh, you say, well, how could he have made a statement like the one you quoted earlier, that the, world, that the, that the militia wasn't at fault and so on? You know what I attributed it to? Tim, and and, and the same thing happens today over and over again. I attribute it to listening to bad advice. What John D. Rockefeller Jr. needed, what people today still need, which is probably why public relations is booming, they need good advice. They need somebody who who has the courage to to come up to them and say, look, you made a mistake, you got to admit it, and you got to change. That's what Ivy Lee offered, and that was what John D. Rockefeller saw, and that's when the Rockefeller family saw the light. Well, after Ivy Lee's involvement, the miners did return to work. Rockefeller turned the page. Even though there was a lot of skepticism, and even even though the union was formed, things went on, and there was this long rehabilitation process of the Rockefeller name. Lee was involved. The miners went back to work. Rockefeller returned to his business interests, and he began this long journey on philanthropy, community support, and set a whole new tone for the company. 
you had described it too as well. When you were involved with it, by the time you came aboard you, many years later, how did that basically affect the way the Rockefeller companies operated from there through the future? When after Ludlow, and as you say, the publicity began to change in terms of the Rockefellers. Here, John D. Rockefeller uh, himself was uh, hated by people, and he began to change his image. He began uh, giving people shiny dimes, and he became uh, more approachable on the newsreels, and they used to uh, show him playing golf and so on. And John D. Jr., his son, gradually moved out of the business structure into a more of a role of doing things for society. And the, and the greatest thing that John D. Jr. did was he had faith, that, the faith enough in New York during the Great Depression to finance the building and buildings that started New York on the way out of the Depression. And those buildings were uh, encompassed in what is now Rockefeller Center, right in the middle of Manhattan, right there on uh, 50th Street, uh, in the center of the city, and uh, John D. Rockefeller uh, Jr. financed that himself. People told him he was crazy. He put workers to work in New York, where they were, where they were starving and, and on bread lines and so on, and really became the savior of the city of New York. And 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 from that, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. financed the land on which the United Nations was built. He created Williamsburg in Virginia which was harkened back to the foundings of our, of our country. He and his father put up the money for Rockefeller University, one of the great scientific universities of that time and, and still to this day. They financed a Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, which became the epicenter for cancer uh, research. They funded black colleges, Spelman College, and other black colleges in the South. And they financed uh, medicine and science and all sorts of things. And this made John D. Rockefeller Jr. much happier than running an oil company or running a mine. And this was really his true pursuit until his death. I'm not sure that Ivy Lee could take credit for all of that, but there was a mindset shift when that happened. And maybe it was a liberating mindset for John D. Rockefeller that he didn't have to be that ruthless titan that his own father might have been. But there's something that you've written, and that is PR is the conscience of the organization. And I think if there is one lesson that came out of all of this, the Ludlow Massacre, the emergence of PR, the role of Ivy Lee, it's that public relations in that case had to become the conscience of the company in order for things to change for the better. What do you think of that term? Is that is that where the birth of that term came from and that mindset for PR? Oh, I, I, I think your, your point is a, is a very good one. I think it well could have been. And uh, basically, what I say to students today and people in this field, I say, you know, what public relations ought to be, and it's, and it's gotten blasted over the past as being snake oil salesmen and, and so on. And even Ivy Lee, by the way, uh, was tarnished at the end of his career by working for the German Die Trust and Adolf Hitler. So even the, the 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 father of public relations had a checkered record in terms of many. But I think public relations has to come down doing the right thing. Do those four words have got to be at the essence of public relations. If my hospital CEO had done the right thing by allowing people to, to stay with their own doctors, he still would be CEO today. And the fact that he isn't, because he didn't do the right thing. And I think if Ivy Lee made one contribution to this field, which is lasting, ought to be lasting, and lingering, it's as you say, you're the conscience of the organization because you're the one, beyond anybody else, beyond the legal counsel and the human resources and marketing and advertising and all the rest, who counsels to do the right thing. Have you ever been to the Ludlow Massacre site? No, I haven't. That's a very, that's a very good question. I haven't been to it. But you know what I, what I did do, Tim, which was uh, one of the highlights of my checkered uh, career, was I sat with David Rockefeller, 
once a week for 10 years, once a week for 10 straight years with a colleague of mine working on Mr. Rockefeller's memoirs. He was the first member of his family ever to write his autobiography, and it took him 10 years, and we we went to his house at Pocanico Hills in in, uh, Westchester in New York once a week, and he would sit there and we'd talk about various aspects of his life. And, of course, the, the, the thing that I was most interested in was the birth of public relations. And uh, as I said, he was quite animated on Ludlow, and he remembered, he remembered uh, clearly how his father had ached over what was happening to the family and the press and what was happening to the people uh, that were working for him in Colorado and how he had changed demonstrably forever as a result of how that Ludlow massacre worked out. And I felt personally, uh, I felt uh, privileged because this, uh, <laughs> this for whatever reason, this was what uh, the, the field to which I dedicated my own life. And here I was as a uh, front row observer on the birth of public relations. Fraser Seitel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tim. It's been great, and I appreciate it. Enjoyed talking to you. The four words are do the right thing, but the three words that I'd ask everybody to remember listening to this is buy my book. Oh, well, if we're going to say that, what's the name of the book and where can they find it? The book is uh, called The Practice of Public Relations, and it's in its 14th edition, and it's holding up some of the biggest doors in America. (laughs) Well, thank you very much, Fraser. Thank you, Tim. To learn more about the Ludlow Massacre, one of the fathers of PR, Ivy Lee, and our guest today, Fraser Seitel, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion, or you could get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook page, and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien. Thank you.